Now, since this class could eat, we're going to call it music appreciation because, like I say, I don't expect uh, you to learn a whole bunch of dates and a whole bunch of names and a whole bunch of uh, uh, details having to do with history. But it is very much a music history class. Now, please, somebody answer the question, what is history? Because I want to play a little game with you. Emily already knows this answer to this question, so don't answer, Emily. Somebody else, tell me what is history. A recorded past. Um, somebody recorded something that happened in the past. Well, thanks for stealing my thunder there, sweetie doll, because I was, I was expecting somebody to say, no, history is what happened, right? But no, history is not what happened. If I throw this up in the air, that happened. But it's not history. Why not, Karina? Because I didn't write about it. Because you didn't write about it. Uh, history is not what happened. History is the com comparison of records. So uh, now we have about 6,000 years of recorded history. Why? Why only 6,000? People have been roaming the earth, earth for a million years. We have myths and, and legend, legends that go way past uh, 4,000 A.D. What's so cool about 4,000 A.D.? Vis-a-vis -vis the concept of recorded history. Writing was invented about 4,000 A.D. There wasn't any way of recording history before there was writing, so there couldn't be any records of history. There, there couldn't be any history. All there was was word of mouth. Word of mouth oral tradition is something which we will come back to momentarily, but keep that in your head. Uh, history is the recorded events that took place. Now, since writing was invented about, like I say, three, 4,000 A.D. or uh, B.C., we have that much recorded history. There's much less recorded history, so there's much less music history because it took people a long time to figure out how to write music. Music history begins with music notation. History is the study of written records. Without writing, there is no history. Oral tradition changes the past with each retelling. Uh, the telephone game, you know, uh, it. I'm 56 years old. I want to tell you that right now because that's an important thing. Uh, my birthday is October 10th, so or 9th, so make sure you remember that next uh, fall. Uh, being, an, being an ancient uh, person as I am, uh, there may be a lot of you that don't know what the telephone game is. Did you ever, when you were in Girl Scouts or something, sit around a table and somebody whispers in your ear a message and then you whisper that same message to the person sitting next to you and the message goes around the table and by the time it comes back, the message has changed? Did you do that when you were little? Mm -hmm. so, yes. so it's not so old. It's not so old. No. Okay. That's, we call that the telephone game. What did you call it? That you called it the game. telephone game. <laughs> And you're from Glen Allen? Uh-huh. Well, Glen Allen is way behind the times. Maybe yeah, that's, that's exactly it. <laughs> anyway, so the, the, the telephone game is all about how oral tradition changes things. Uh, so even though, even though we have music from a long, long time ago that's been passed down by oral tradition for centuries, the chances of it being exactly like what it started out to be are extremely slim. Only writing will fix something in history forever, or at least as long as the medium uh, exists. You know, one of these days there's going to be no such thing as paper. And uh, how are all these things that haven't been transferred to computer uh, uh, digital medium going to survive? Who knows? Anyway. Okay, there were attempts at creating a music notation in the ancient worlds of China and India, we know this because they tell us, we don't have any examples of it. Uh, in Greece, there's a famous stone with the hymn to Apollo written on it, complete with some kind of music notation. Unfortunately, we can't read it. We know it's music notation because it's little squiggles over the words, but we can't, we have no way of figuring out what it means. I thought you might want to see a Greek, t this is, this is one of the, uh, there is, a, there is a thing called the Library of, of Delphi, I think, 
And that's where this, I couldn't find a, a, a picture of the actual Apollo stone. I've seen it, but I uh, couldn't find a picture of it. This, but there, I thought you'd like to see a picture of a lady with her head cut off. So there's the Temple of Isis. And here is the text to the hymn to Apollo. This may be the oldest song lyric in the world. Shall I improvise a song and sing it to you? I think not. Um, well, I mean, Deus, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son, Phoebus Apollo. Something like that. No applause, huh? Yay! <laughs> Now, here's a picture of Europe at about 700. Um, this, can you see the air? Yeah, this is Italy. Italy is of very important, extreme importance. Here, of course, is Greece down here. The uh, Near East is over here. Here's Africa. I'm pointing all these things out, pointing out the opposite, obvious because it'll be important in a minute. This is Spain, here's France, here's England, and here's Norway up here. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, in order to trace the beginning, I think the, 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 beginning, the beginnings of music history are very interesting. And uh, how, how, the, uh, how the notation got introduced is, is a very interesting subject. Now, the Roman Empire existed for about 600 years. It goes all the way from 200 BC to just about exactly 400 or 450 AD. And Rome took over this huge amount of area. Uh, they, they, they took over Egypt, of course the Holy Land, everybody, everybody knows that, that Jesus uh, was born and lived under Roman rule. All of this stuff was ruled by Greek, by uh, Rome, up here into Germany, all of Spain, as far north as England. I don't know whether the, the Romans ever got into Ireland. I think not. I think they got like as far north as Scotland about the time of uh, King Arthur. And uh, they, their forward advance of, of Rome began to cease about there. Uh, and this went on, like I say, for about, by, by the time four, 300 or 400 A.D. rolled around, Rome, this was Rome. All that we know of, of, uh, of uh, Europe was Rome. Now, the so-called Dark Ages extend from about 400, some people say as, as late as 1400. I don't buy that. I think it probably uh, stops being... Uh, the Dark Ages as early as 800 or 900, especially based on what I'm about to tell you. Um, but the, the Dark Ages were the Dark Ages because they were constantly, when the, when the Roman Empire um, fell apart, so the, the Rome provided two big things, provided roads which connected all of the uh, principalities to each other made it much easier to get to and they provided military support for their social structures. Uh, the military support was most important because uh, Rome was was sort of, you know culturally socially Rome was like heaven. They provided they were they were jerky to their people in a lot of ways but they provided order, they provided structure and they they uh, you know they protected their lands from the, the barbarians, which were uh, teeming on all sides, on the uh, on the African on the African side, we had the Muslims. You know, uh, uh, Muhammad started uh, Muhammadism about 400 
AD, 400, 600. I forget. I should have looked that up, huh? 4, 600, but 4, 600 AD. And so they started their own sort of conquest. The Vikings came down from the north. They uh, they, they would like land on uh, a uh, a coast and totally just they were like pirates. They would uh, take over a town, kidnap the the uh, young virgins and burn everything up and steal all the money and then go back uh, to Norway. The Huns, Adel of the Hun, you've heard of him, and and the the um, Visigoths, I think it was another tribe, came over from from these Slavic countries and invaded and took over uh, Germany. They did all, all this all this invasion and stuff took place very rapidly in historical terms. I mean, these people would come and take over an area and, and it would last for maybe 50, 100 years and then somebody else would come and invade again and there was a constant turnover of cultures all through this period of, of 400 to uh, 800 or 900. So the reason it's called dark is because with that sort of turnover of culture, there was no time for an artistic tradition to, to spring up. The Roman tradition had been totally obliterated, so that was lost. And there was nothing that these barbarians could supply that uh, could uh, keep pace with the constant destruction. The, these people could barely uh, keep their... Uh, physical lives together, let alone enjoy a sonnet or, or listen to a piece of music. The barbarians brought their own folk music with them, um, but it still wasn't of a quality, of an, an enduring enough quality to have any serious or lasting impact. So, um, one social entity remained constant. What was it? Through all of this uh, constantly destroying and rebuilding civilization, there was one thing that the, the uh, barbarians didn't destroy. It remained constant. What was that entity? The music? Nice the, try. The, no. <laughs> music is, is... What was it? Religion. The Catholic Church was became the official religion of the Roman Empire in about 400 A.D. And although these invaders kept coming through and changing the political structure, the Catholic Church remained constant. Um, and that's an, that, that that's probably the most important historical fact of all of modern uh, history. The Catholic Church remained constant. There's the Catholic Church. Isn't it cool? This is a medieval painting. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, stood up and fought against evil. There's St. George and the Dragon. Now, the first of our uh, music history heroes is Pope Gregory. Um, uh, he was Pope from five... Uh, we're, the, the first musical form we're going to look at is called Gregorian chant. And uh, for a long time, people thought that Pope Gregory was responsible for Gregorian chant. This is actually not true at all. But he is responsible for something very important. Um, and it has to do with the telephone game. So I always ask, who's been to McDonald's? In, you know, the joke in Glen Allen here is that people come to the visitor center and ask where's the closest McDonald's, and they say, turn left, and it's the second light. The, but the second light is four hours down the road. But I bet, I bet a lot of you have eaten at that McDonald's in Palmer. Raise your hand if you've eaten, if you've eaten at the McDonald's in Palmer. How many have eaten at McDonald's in Anchorage? How many have eaten at McDonald's in Seattle? How about Los Angeles? Anybody? Anybody eaten at McDonald's in Los Angeles? What about New York? Anybody eaten there? 
Uh, Jun Ho, have you eaten at McDonald's in Korea? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Why? Why would you go to Europe or to, to Japan or, or someplace far away and cool? Why would you go to McDonald's? They have ice cubes you can put in your water there. They in have Europe. ice cubes. What else? <laughs> ice cubes are familiar, aren't they? I mean, you can't always get ice cubes elsewhere. Um, in Europe, what else? Always. Why do you go to McDonald's if you're if you're in the 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 uh, fl the magnificent Orient where you can eat all kinds of uh, weird fish and new kinds of interesting food? What why if you're in Germany you can have stroganoff made like the uh, Holy Roman Empire? Emperor ate it. Why would you go to McDonald's? Because you're used you know to it. You're because you know what you're getting. Good boy. Look, you guys in Valdez don't get this. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> if I could email you your Altoids, I would. I would. But um, whenever you get a, whenever you say something smart, you get an Altoid. So uh, Daniel gets the first one of the class. Um, say again. Why did you go to McDonald's? You know what you're getting. You know what you're getting. You go to McDonald's because it's familiar. And um, sometimes we want something familiar. So Pope Gregory's main contribution to history was that he's the one who started the push towards keeping the Catholic Church the same. See, the thing is, as, as, as we know from the telephone game, when, you, when things are passed on, by oral tradition, they can change uncontrollably. And uh, what does the word Catholic mean anyway? What's the difference? Huh? Universal. It means universal. Catholic means everybody's the same. And if we've got a church in Rome that's that's doing a certain kind of, by the way, let's learn a word, um, liturgy. Oops, let me see. If you don't know, know that word, learn it. Liturgy is the church service, basically. Everybody who goes to church knows that there's a certain pattern. You come in, and they, maybe there's a hymn first, and then there's a, a Bible reading, and then there's a uh, announcements, and then there's a sermon, and then there's another hymn, and there's, there's, a, there's a certain form that a church service follows, and that is called the liturgy. Now, the Catholic Church had a certain liturgy. Uh, each, each of the year, the whole Catholic year, you know, it went from Christmas to Easter and all the way around. And there was a specific text for each Sunday of the year. And uh, obviously there were certain uh, Sundays where it was the same every year, like a Christmas is always going to be that text, and Easter is always going to be that text, and Kingdom Tide is gonna be always going to be that text, and so on. Um, and, of course, there was music associated with these texts. So... The thing was, Pope Gregory was very nervous because they might be singing a certain text to a certain tune down in Rome, and in Milan, they might be singing a different words or different, slightly different tune because of the telephone game. And in Paris, they might be singing something else, and in uh, Madrid, they might be singing something else. So Pope Gregory's main contribution was to say, we need to have this, all Christians to be saying the same words and singing the same tunes every Sunday. Now this is difficult because there, each one of these uh, big uh, centers had developed their own sort of music. Rome had their preferred, see these chants, when we talk about Gregorian chant, we talk about music which has been passed down by word of mouth from the time of Jesus. There, there are a lot of... Uh, they come from Greek sources and Near Eastern sources, uh, but as they, as these big cities—Rome, Milan, Madrid, Paris, Berlin, uh, Munich, London—as all these metropolitan areas have their church services and their church tradition uh, uh, grows over the years, subtle changes were introduced, and. That's the formula for disaster because if, if everybody starts doing different things, pretty soon they're going to have different thoughts in their heads and pretty soon the church is going to crumble. 
So to keep the Catholic Church Catholic and universal, we have to have the same words, the same tune, the same liturgy spoken and sung in every church in the uh, realm. Now, how are we going to keep it the same if we can't write it down? That's the problem. Now, the Frankish kings. <clears throat> the, the Frankish kings were a, a, a family of, of uh, invader rulers who did a lot to replace the Roman order. There was Pepin the first from 741 to 7. He, he is not what this is not when he lived. This is when he was king, and uh, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, 768 to 814. He's a, why does it do that? That's obnoxious. Um, anyway, these guys, I don't I don't care that much. But I feel like it's reporting on my sins or my bad grammar or something. Um, the Frankish kings, basically what they did is they chased out the barbarian hordes who had come and taken over their country, uh, all through France and Germany in particular, but down through Italy as well, not so much Spain. Spain is a different story. But um, these Frankish kings took over large areas of Europe, and the thing about conquerors is that once you once you have taken over a country then you have it and what do you do with it especially if the people don't like you if the people liked being barbarians if they have if they had their own traditions and you come in and try to replace them they're not going to just follow you blindly uh, but remember the Catholic Church is constant so Pope Stephan who was pope in 754, has this meeting with uh, Charlemagne. Charlemagne. Charlemagne says, Steve, sit down, have some clams. We got these, these, these people here. They don't like me, and I want them to like me. What can you do to like me? Why can you go? Can you tell them to like me? Please tell them to like me. Stephen says, uh, Charlie baby, what's in it for me? So Charlie thinks, well, let's see. What's in it for him? Well, I took over thousands of square miles. I could give him some land. Land in these days is better than money. It's the same thing as money. So the fame, everybody has heard that the Vatican is the the highest concentration of gold, it used to, used to be anywhere, I don't know whether Fort Knox is surpassed, but the Vatican is, is a very rich bank of money. And the Catholic Church, even though it, it's waning in its influence and in, uh, population, even as we speak, is still one of the richest uh, financial institutions in the world. And it goes all the way back to uh, the 700s with the papal land grants. Uh, uh, Charlemagne and Pepin gave huge amounts of land to the Catholic Church on which they grew crops. Um, everybody has that, you know, how many have seen, no, Robin Hood? You know, Friar Tuck, the fat monk. Why is he huh? fat? Because in the, mo in the monasteries, they had a rich life. They, 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 were the, they grew all their food. They grew... They grew cattle, and they also. What, what's what, one of the other things about uh, Friar Tuck? What's the, one of his vices? I don't know. Friar Tuck is a drunk, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's a Disney movie. <laughs> oh, that, oh, uh, well, you, you, you went watching the wrong Robin Hood. There must have been about ten Robin Hood movies. Most of, in most of the Robin Hood movies, uh, Friar Tuck is constantly drinking wine. The reason he's drinking wine is because they grew grapes on these monastery grounds, and uh, the, the best way to turn grapes into money was to turn it into wine, and they sell the wine. But since there was a lot of wine there, they didn't just sell it all. They drank <laughs> a lot of it, you know. So, um, so on these uh, on these land grants, the monasteries were established, and the monasteries become a key ingredient in uh, 
the development of music notation. Now, Pope Leo crowned Charlemagne on, on Christmas Day, 800 AD, the Holy Roman Empire. Now, it was called the Roman Empire because it was an attempt to recreate the Roman Empire, which had since fallen uh, to disintegrate it. And it was holy because it was endorsed by the church. So it was a perfect wedding of religion and politics. And from, from this point on, Europe is a much more safe place. And from this point on, culture has a chance. It has, a, it has a, 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 some soil to sink roots in so that a cultural life can spring up. And it, it, it might be said that our music history begins as early as 800 because there are attempts to write down music as early as 800. We'll get to this in very shortly. Now, to distinguish between the, the difference between a priest and a monk, a priest works at the parish, administers to the people. Here's confessions that administers mass. He's, this, he's the social guy. He's the minister. He's the town minister. The monks don't live in town. They live out of town. They live in these, these far away sort of protected places called monasteries. And they, the, the, the monastic life, although they did have a lot of fun, <laughs> they had all, the, all they wanted to eat and all they wanted to drink, obviously, but they also um, had a very rigorous schedule of uh, prayers. Uh, every, every three hours, uh, they had to meet in the, in the chapel for prayers and meditation, and then they would go back to whatever they were doing. Um, but they, so they, they, they had a lot of time for private study, uh, and they, of course, they did their farm work. They contributed to the wealth of the Catholic Church. Um, one of the things they did was, see, there weren't, no, there weren't any copy machines. There were, the printing press hadn't even been invented yet. Um, I think 1520 is the date of the uh, printing press. So we're, we're, we're uh, 600 years before any sort of printing. So anything that was, any literature that was passed down had to be copied by hand. And that's one of the things the monks did. They, uh, they went to the uh, ancient manuscripts and either made fair copies of them or they translated them. And the illuminated manuscripts are vestiges of that work. This here is, is a typical title page of one of these pages. Uh, a monk might spend months on just one of these pages. Some of the other ones look more like this. This one here is obviously somebody's uh, description of a plant. The, uh, the, you remember in Romeo and Juliet, Friar Lawrence is the guy who's good with drugs. He's, he's the one who puts together concoctions of different things, all herbal medicines and stuff like that. That was the kind of thing that uh, the monks did too. You've heard of Mendel in the 1800s, 1870. Mendel, the one who did the experiments with peas, the first experiments with genetics. That guy was a monk. So the, the monastic system continued all the way up to... Did I say 17? 18. It was in the 18, 1870. Did I say 1870? Um, all the way to the 20th century, uh, the monks were involved in scholastic procedures. Uh, and, of course, uh, hospitals, you know, the, the, the cliche of the nun who's a nurse. You know, they were all involved in uh, services like that. Here's an here's a, a illuminated manuscript that's mostly just text with a few little pictures in there. They, they would start each chapter heading with a little picture like that. So one of the things that they did is try to figure out, for Pope Gregory's sake, how to preserve this music. Now how do we get this picture out of there? Uh, no. Eh. I, there's no way it's not in the way. Uh, that's good, good enough. Um, can you read this text up here? You can't really, can you? Yeah, it's not, we can. It doesn't matter that much. Um, 
This first line here is an example of the earliest type of music notation. Now these little, we have the words obviously, and uh, these little squiggles up above, they're called nooms. Uh, noom just means name. And what you have here, this little squiggle, represents a melodic pattern, like da-da-da-da. So that noom means sa -cri. And th this little noom may, may mean da-da-da. Uh, so fi -ka. So sa -cri fi -ka. I'm just making this up, but that's an example of what it was supposed to be. So these little patterns written over the uh, uh, words gave you an approximate, it obviously can't be that precise because there's no key center or anything, but um, these little nooms represent the little m melodic cliches. Any musical style has little cliches in it. Da -dum, da -dum, dum 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 You've heard that before? Heard da 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 da. Heard bum 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 bum. Heard that before? These are all cliches that are part of style. So the the Gregorian uh, uh, literature had their cliches, and they could be expressed with these little abbreviated symbols called nooms. Uh, going to about so the eleventh century. Sorry. The nooms, those were the first type of like music notes or notations or whatever that yeah, were ever they about. They stand for little melodic cliches. Okay. Now, if you follow the chart down, somebody here in uh, the 12th and 13th century got the brilliant idea of making a graph. See the graph? And then the nooms can sit on the little graph. That way, these nooms could be transposed. For instance, if this means da 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 da, then if you wrote it down here, it could be da 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 da. So it means it's the same pattern, but it'll be lower, right? And then this is a lot of you have seen this sort of notation before. I bet this is somewhat familiar. You may have seen this on Christmas cards or something, you know. <coughs> Again, it's uh, the text underneath, and this quasi-pneumatic notation, which starts to look more and more like our notes, doesn't it? See the little squares look our, like our note heads, and we've got these little stems that mean that refer to durations and whatnot. Then it looks like this, then it looks like this, and by the time we get to the end, it looks like something that we can read. Da 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 my pitch, but that's, that, that's what that looks like. And it goes all the way back to there. I find that very interesting. But the point is that from this early date, people are trying to write the music down. And thus, we have a written tradition that you can start to build on. Now remember that the initial purpose for music notation was not creative. The initial purpose of music notation was to preserve the past. The church is always interested in preserving the past. Musicians are not always quite so uh, reactionary. Now, one of the, remember the title of this lecture is The Global Significance of Western Music. The introduction of notation, and remember that the Western monks in the Catholic Church were the first ones to invent a music notation. And so that gave Western music a, a huge leg up over other musics. There are, there are uh, Oriental music, I've heard uh, gamelan music, and uh, uh, Chinese uh, processional music, and uh, Afri oh, the African choral music is out of this world, you know. It's way better 
it, it's it's certainly equal in interest to anything I've heard of Gregorian chant. But it never got written down, so it never had a chance to to become developed. So it still, as the Gregorian chant led to something ever more and more sophisticated and universal and and specific, the uh, the the folk music that we have left from these other cultures begins to pale in comparison. Um, think of it this way. You have 15% of your brain devoted to... Where's my picture? Well, you have 15% of your brain devoted to hearing. That 15% is, guess what, next to your ears, <laughs> right here. You got 60% of your brain in the visual cortex devoted to seeing. Now, once you can see music instead of just hear it, obviously, with, with what that's three times the brain space. There's got to be more involved. Once you can see it, it becomes something that a lot more of your whole self can be involved in creating, and so. Uh, and if you see, if you were a uh, Indian musician playing the sitar, playing a raga to the rising sun, the, ri the sun takes three hours to rise, and you you play uh, rhapsodic, inspired, intuitive, ecstatic improvisations to the rising of the sun, you may achieve a, a state of spiritual bliss through music, but you can't tell me at nine o'clock you're going to remember what you played at 6 o'clock. Forget it. No way. But if you have some way of recording it, then you can. And once you have that recording, you can build on it in a way that you can't build on something that you can't remember. So using more of the brain makes Western music more powerful. And raising it to a higher level of conceptual content making it large scale and making it conscious. These are things that, that uh, the non-written music simply can't compete with. So, in this instructor's humble opinion, the global significance of Western art music is in this. The creation of a system of music notation capable of supporting large scale thinking and capable of generating a tradition through which artists could build upon the accomplishments of their predecessors. See, that's another thing the Raga player can't do. The Raga player can't pass on his ideas to the next generation. He certainly can't pass on the uh, content of that one particular improv. He can pass on the Raga, and the Ragas are actually written down, or, or they're, they're so small that they uh, are easily memorized, but uh, nobody can write down a whole Indian improv. It's just too long and there's no way to do it. Um, so these accomplishments gave Western art music the potency to eventually dominate the entire musical world. Even as, as recently as when I was young, um, you could look at a potent folk music from Africa, from Japan, from Australia, but just in the in the uh, 30 or 40 years since I got old, the media has so flooded the entire world with our American popular music that uh, everybody is really pretty much hearing the same music now, and uh, it's only because it got written down. It's not because it's better. It got written down, and it got a, it got a foothold into a larger state of consciousness. <laughs>